been talking about this great Acts 4.12, this, this powerful evangelistic verse, but also this offensive example of what theologians call the scandal of particularity, the exclusive claim, the claim that Christ is not only Savior, but Christ is the Savior, the only Savior. It's an amazing thing to claim. What I'd like to do now is I would like to circle back to the miracle of Acts 3 and come forward again and to show you how it all, it all ties in, what's going on here. The leaders wanted to know, how did you heal this man? Well, we heal the man in the power of the name. What is the significance of that and, and what's the power of the healing? First of all, let's talk about another hard thing. The hard thing is that not everybody gets well. Not everybody is healed. We live in a world where everybody dies eventually. During the ministry of Jesus, uh, there are three resurrections recorded. We're quite certain he raised many people from the dead, but we're only told about three. Lazarus, the widow of Nain's son, and Jairus' daughter. Now, we're told enough about those people for the readers in the first century to check out the reports. Jairus was a synagogue ruler in Galilee. Many, many people would have known who Jairus was. Um, Nain was a really tiny village, a very, very, very tiny village. There could only be one widow in that village whose son died before she did. If Jesus had worked the great miracle for a synagogue ruler's daughter, for the son of a widow in a tiny village, everyone in the village would have known about it. Everybody in Galilee would have known about it. Bethany was very close to Jerusalem. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived in Bethany. Not everyone in Jerusalem would have known someone in Bethany, but everyone in Bethany would have known someone in Jerusalem. And so everyone could have found out if there really were someone in Bethany named Mary and Martha who had a brother named Lazarus who was raised from the dead by Jesus. These are, these are things which would have been easily proven in the first century. But here's what we, and not only the first century, but in the 19th century, a German archeological team in 1872 uncovered a family burial crypt in Bethany, 1900 years old. It had three names on it, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. That's a historical fact. But you know what? The widow of Nain's son, died again. Jairus' daughter died again. And Lazarus died again. We live in a world where everybody dies. If you want to blame God for death, you can. And some people do. The fact is God made a world without death. And the fact is death came into the world through sin, and sin came into the world through unbelief. God invites us to a world without death, but we only get there on His terms. We cannot get there if we don't believe because it's unbelief which brings death, and the place He invites us is a place without death. So we get there by believing. Now. When Jesus came to this planet, it wasn't his goal to heal everybody now. It was his goal to bring all who would believe in him to a place where you didn't need any healing because there was no sickness, there was no suffering, there was no death. The apostles did not heal everybody. The point of the healing was to show the authority, the truth which comes, the power which comes, and the salvation which comes through the name Jesus of Nazareth, the name 
in which they healed everyone. The miracle was to authenticate the authority of the messengers and to show the power of the name. Um, now, um, when we're born on this planet, we receive a nature from our parents. That nature is sick. That nature is weak. That nature one day dies. It's a mortal nature. The gospel delivers us from this deep poverty, the poverty of our nature, the fact that we have a body which gets sick, the fact that we have a body which is going to die. To bring us out of our poverty into the riches of God's own kingdom to bring us to a place where we can never die, to bring us eternal life. Um, so what, what's happening in these miracles is that the consequences of the fall, Adam and Eve's sin, which brings in suffering and death, are being taken away in this one individual instance for a little while. But as long as we stay on this planet, everybody's going to get sick and everybody's going to die. If they're raised, they'll die twice until we're taken to the place without death. Now, in my opinion, uh, the greatest preacher in English of the 20th century, he was actually born the last year of the 19th century. He was born in 1899, was a man who had no theological training at all. He was a Welshman who grew up in London, and his name was Martin Lloyd-Jones. Martin Lloyd-Jones trained to be a doctor, and he was not just any doctor. He was a brilliant doctor because his, his major professor at Bartholomew's Hospital in, at the University of London was a man called Thomas Horder. Thomas Horder was the most famous doctor in England. And the reason he was the most famous doctor in England is because when the King of England was dying in 1910, Edward VII, he called for Lord Horder. He called for Dr. Horder, and everybody knew it. The King was dying. Who did he want to see? He wanted to see a doctor. No, not a doctor, one particular doctor, Thomas Horder. That one particular doctor was Martin Lloyd-Jones professor at the University of London. A time came when Dr. Horder was examining a patient with the class. Dr. Horder said, this man has this certain disease. There was a student in the class who said, no, sir, that's not the disease he has. He has a different disease. That student was Martin Lloyd-Jones. The professor would not back down. The student would not back down. In time, it was proven that the student was right and the great professor was wrong. Now, Thomas Horder was not a Christian, but he was a noble man and he was a fair man. And instead of being embarrassed and humiliated, and instead of making an enemy of that young student, he made him a friend. And he invited him into his practice in London. So now this young new doctor is completely set up for life because he's the chief assistant of the most famous doctor in Great Britain, Lord Thomas Horder. And one day when Lord Horder retires, the brilliant young assistant Martin Lloyd-Jones will become his successor and take over his practice. Now, not only that, but Martin Lloyd-Jones' wife was a doctor. And they got married in 1926. Her father was a doctor. Let me tell you something. In 1926, they didn't just give away medical degrees to women. You had to be so overqualified. You had, and, and, and Russia today, there are more women who are doctors than men. In England in 1926, there were probably 1,000 doctors who were men to every one woman who was a doctor. She had to be way, way overqualified. Do you know that that young doctor married to that young woman who was also a doctor, that they both gave up medicine 
and moved to a poor village where he became the pastor of the local church and that they never practiced medicine again. They were in their 20s and they both lived to their 80s and they never practiced medicine again. Do you know why? Here's what Martin Lloyd-Jones said. If I make a man well because I'm a physician, I only make him well to sin again. And the day will come when I cannot make him well. The day will come when he will die. And he will die just as surely as he would have died if I had never been his doctor or if he'd never met a doctor. But if I can make a man well spiritually, if I can show him the gospel is true, and if he believes it, and if he puts his faith and trust in Jesus, he will never die. He will always be well forever. Now you see, it's wonderful, wonderful that the man who could never walk from the time he was born was able to walk and to run and to jump and to praise God. That's wonderful, but it wasn't the main thing. It wasn't the most important thing. The important thing was to call attention to the name. The name. The power of the name. Jesus of Nazareth. And the healing that he brings to the soul. The pardon that he brings for sinners. The eternal life that he gives through his death in his resurrection. That's what's going on here. That's what's happening in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4. They're not trying to heal everybody physically. They're trying to heal everybody spiritually. And they're trying to get them to pay attention to the reality is no matter how many physical advantages you get, whether it's the advantages of health, whether it's the advantages of wealth, one day you're going to lay all that down and you're going to die. And then the only thing that matters is whether you have forgiveness from sin and a li the life everlasting which you can only receive through this name, the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now this was the very name which offended the, um, the Jewish rulers. This is the name that Satan hates. The most famous atheist in the world right now is a former professor of zoology at Oxford called Richard Dawkins. I saw the tape of a debate he had with a wonderful man who teaches at Oxford also called John Lennox, a debate in Birmingham, Alabama. And they were debating, they were talking about science and they were talking about the elements in the universe and how finely tuned those elements were. And if those numbers were off just a little bit, there'd be no life anywhere in the universe. And they were debating, Dawkins had to admit that really in biology you cannot account for the existence of life. You can only explain the development of life, but you can't explain why life is really here. So they were going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Richard Dawkins is a very handsome man. He's an attractive man. He's a very impressive man. He's a great Oxford professor. But at the end of the debate, John Lennox began to talk about Jesus. John Lennox began to say the name of Jesus. It was John Lennox began to preach the cross of Jesus. And a change came over Richard Dawkins. He was no longer calm. He was no longer sweet. He was angry and there was hatred in his face. He said, oh, you were talking about science before, but now you've got to talk about Jesus. And now you've got to talk about the cross and Jesus. And it was like the devil came out of Richard Dawkins. And it was obvious that he hates Jesus. He hates 
the name of Jesus. But you know what? There's power in that name. There's power in that name to show who we really are who we really belong to, where we really came from, and where we're really going. That's the name being revealed in Jerusalem by the apostles. And there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now, look at verse 13. They, that is the rulers, the priests, they observe the confidence of Peter and John. And they understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, and they were amazed. The Greek is, they saw that they were agramatoi kai idiotai. They were untrained, and uh, uneducated and untrained. They hadn't been to school. What that means is they haven't been to the right schools. Now, in America, almost everybody goes to college. And in your country, a much smaller percentage of people go. And usually the people who go are pretty bright. When I lived in Moscow, I worked with lot, lots and lots and lots of MGU students and lots and lots and lots of Bauman students. And MGU is the Harvard of Russia, and Bauman is the MIT of Russia. Harvard and MIT are the two most prestigious schools in America one for the liberal arts and humanities and one for um, technology and science. And um, it's interesting, when I would talk, people at MGU and Bauman would write. And I would think about how funny that is. Um, because, you know, my wife's grandmother is a university graduate was a university graduate. She's dead now. My wife's grandmother is a university graduate. My wife's father is a university graduate. Do you know that there are no, I have no grandparents or parents or aunts or uncles or brothers or sisters, or first cousins who've ever graduated from university? None. That's just not who we are. We're proletariats. We're workers. We're lower class. We're blue, blue collar. That's who I am. That's where I came from. I'm glad. I love those people. I like being with them. I'm comfortable around them. And they have their own wisdom, the wisdom of peasants and the wisdom of people who work with their hands and know how to do things, you know. I love those people. Peter and John were fishermen. They worked outside. They worked all night. They hadn't been to school. They hadn't been trained. And here you have all these highly educated, rich, trained debaters, these rabbis and these priests who hated Jesus. And here are these two fishermen, these two men who work at night and work with their hands. And as they're thinking about what's going on, all of a sudden they realize that these people haven't even been, begin, they haven't even been to school. They haven't even been the students at the school. We're the professors at the school. Now this leaves us with a great question. Why are they winning this debate? If we're so smart and they are so uneducated, why are they winning this debate? The answer is in the text. They had been with Jesus. That's an education. 
they'd been with Jesus. C.S. Lewis again. C.S. Lewis was one of the most educated people who ever lived. C.S. Lewis could read and write Greek and Latin by the time he was 14 years old. His mother taught him French before he was 10 because his mother had a university degree in French and in mathematics. C.S. Lewis wrote volume three of the Oxford History of English Literature. It's about 600 pages long, 700 pages long. C.S. Lewis had a chair of literature, a professorship created just for him at Cambridge University. So he taught at Oxford, he taught at Cambridge. He was probably the great man of his generation at Oxford. And he spent the last nine years of his life at Cambridge. C.S. Lewis said this of John Bunyan. Lewis said, Christianity is an education in itself. If a man has not had the benefit of formal training, of going to the right schools, but he studied the Bible and he understands Christian theology, he's okay. We cannot say of him that he's not an educated man. If he knows Scripture, if he knows Christianity, if he knows Christ, he is a thoroughly educated man. And then he says, how else could have untrained believer like Bunyan have written a book which has simply astonished the world? He was talking about Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress was written by a man whose job was to sell pots and pans. He never, ever went to university but he studied the English Bible and he knew what was in it. TVS is a perfect way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support our educational and outreach ministry today. We exist solely upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvseminary.com. John the Apostle wrote the fourth gospel, and John the Apostle is one of the, he's one of the men standing here. He's one of the men who was agramatoi kai idiotai, ignorant and untrained. John the Apostle wrote the prologue to the gospel of John, John 1, 1 through 14, or John 1, 1 through 18. That is the purest theology, especially verses 1 through 5. Verses 1 through 5 are the purest theology ever written in the history of writing. In the beginning was the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now here's the question. How does a fisherman write profound theology? How does a man who works all night on a boat do that? I'll tell you how. He put his head right here on Jesus' breast, and he kept it there. He was completely transformed. Not only transformed intellectually, but transformed in his emotions and in his character because John liked to fight. He was rough. The Gospel of Mark said that Jesus had a nickname for John and his brother. He called them the Sons of Thunder. And you remember in Luke's Gospel, when they come back from witnessing in the Samaritan villages, they didn't get any results. And James and John said to Jesus, can we kill them now? Can we bring down fire from heaven on their villages? Men, women, and children, can we kill them all? Can we, can we, can we? That's horrible. But that's what they were like. They were rough. They wanted revenge. They wanted the people who disagreed with them to die. But later, John becomes the apostle of love. As a matter of fact, he writes about love more times in his gospel than all three other gospel writers put together. 
How does a man who wants to kill everybody become the apostle of love? And how does an ignorant, untrained, uneducated fisherman write the most profound theology which has ever been written? I'll tell you how. Puts his head right here. Puts his head right here. And he keeps it there. Now, I hope you have lots of opportunities. I did have the opportunity to go to university. I did have the opportunity to go to graduate school. I'm very grateful for it. I'm not a doctor. I'm not even a nurse. I'm not a professor. I'm nobody important. But I have had the opportunity to spend time with Jesus. And whatever opportunities you don't have, you will have that opportunity. And if you take that opportunity, it will be enough. Some men and some women are born in the houses of the rich. They have tutors who come to their homes. They are taken in limousines to the best schools. They get into the best schools because the best universities because maybe their grandfather gave money to that university. Maybe they don't even deserve to go to the university because they're not that bright, but they get those privileges anyway. And maybe you and I will not have those privileges. But if we have Christ, we have greater privileges. Every believer gets 24 hours a day. Nobody gets any more than that. The wealthiest person in the world cannot buy more than 24 hours a day. Every believer gets 24 hours a day and all the promises of God. All the promises of God. Every believer gets Christ's name to pray in. The name that Peter and John used to heal the lame man. The name that Peter will use to raise the dead in Acts chapter 9. The name that Paul will use to raise the dead in Acts chapter 20. Prayer is the truest democracy. Every believer gets 24 hours. Nobody ever gets any more than that. Every believer gets all the promises of God. Nobody ever gets any more than that. The son of Bill Gates and the son of the Queen of England cannot have more of Christ than you get. Don't ever remember that. Don't ever forget that. And remember that even though these were um, uneducated and untrained, the Jewish leaders were amazed. They were amazed. And the reason they were amazed is because they had been with Jesus. Verse 14 says, Seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. How could they say something in reply? The man couldn't walk, and now he can walk. Now, I'm going to tell you one last thing, which has to do with apologetics, and then we're done. Um, if these claims were false, everyone who went to the temple would have known they were false. This man sat in front of the temple. Hundreds of people would have seen him. Thousands of people would have seen him. If they said that they'd healed him and he hadn't been healed, Christianity would have been proven to be untrue. But the claims weren't false. It really happened. The claims are bold. The claims are audacious because the claims are true. There's one God who made heaven and earth. Jesus of Nazareth is his son and we are his followers. Amen.
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.